Okay, and if the answer is no, what am I expecting him to say? Okay. Take it away, Maggie. If his answer is no, you know he's lying. All right, here you go. I'm ringing the bell. So we'll get started here. Lovely. That's my, that's some alarm I have going here. So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to October 8th meeting. I'm sitting early for Ian, who is, um, is somewhere where he's trying to use his remote Wi-Fi or whatever they call these things. So um, I will do this until he comes and um, we'll just move along. I want to welcome everybody first. Let's check in, welcome any visiting Rotarians. Do we have any first? We'll start with that. Do we have any visiting Rotarians? And you all need to help me because I cannot see everyone because of this silly shared screen. Um, whoops. Any visiting Rotarians? If not, I know we have lots of visiting guests. Let's uh, look at our guests. Take your hand off the mouse. Um, I'm looking at our guests. We have some folks here from uh, Rotaract or Interact. Let's go back to them first because they're visiting Rotarians. Um, let's see who's there. I see, I know there's someone here. Help me out guys. Lark, are you? No, you're our guest. Oh, Lark, go ahead and introduce yourself. Go for it. You're our, you're our speaker guest today, but go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Lark Doolin, and uh, my mom is a Rotarian down in Berkeley. So I've been to quite a few Rotary meetings down there, and I've spoken for them. And um, so while I am not a Rotarian, my mom certainly is. And it's a privilege to be back uh, presenting again for Queer Humboldt this time. Great. Nice to see you. Welcome. And Nico, you want to introduce yourself? <sighs> I'd be happy to. My name is Nico Campan. Um, I am a Southern California transplant, uh, and I am here to assist Lark in the presentation today. Very excited to be here. So thank you. Great. Welcome. And I, I'm doing this in no particular order. It's when I see this you on the screen. So Tracy, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself, please? <sighs> Sure. My name is Tracy Day, and I'm a um, State Farm agent, a new State Farm agent here in, in Arcata, and I just wanted to come and visit and see what you guys are all about. Wonderful, wonderful. And I'm going to um, Mike. I think you have someone to introduce there. You're muted, Mike. We know what you're saying, but we still want to hear it. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. My fiance Mira and her two girls are finally here with me. And uh, we've already been very active with our Rotary group. Wonderful, welcome. Yay, that's wonderful. We look forward to meeting you in person and uh, welcome, to, welcome to this little corner of the United States. It's probably one of the better corners, but I'm biased. So now I want to go and see, I see Izzy. Let's have you introduce yourself, Izzy. Hi, um, my name is Izzy and I was on exchange in Arcata 2017 and 18. And today I'm going to give you a short presentation about my life after my exchange. Absolutely wonderful. We're really happy to see you. So um, I went to the next slide, but the first slide reminded you all that um, somebody is going to win the raffle today. So please buy your Venmo tickets and um, good luck to everybody. Um, these are some save the date things coming up today at, uh, at quarter to noon. The uh, District Ethics and Business Awards is happening via Zoom. I know they had a lot of good nominations, some local um, businesses as well. So if you have time to check that out, you should have received the link in, in the email. Tomorrow is um, an opportunity for fellowship and community. It's a walk to end Alzheimer's and they're not doing it all as a group. They're, everyone is kind of doing it wherever they live, but I know there'll be a gathering at the plaza. There'll be people out there. So if you want to support that, um, 
and support, especially we've got um, Rachel and Melinda both who are active, had a, team, had a team party last night at the pub and some of us were there and I'm still waiting for the call that I won everything, but I haven't gotten it yet. So um, I guess I didn't win everything. So anyway, so that's happening tomorrow. October 11th, there's an info night on Youth Exchange and Ian sent that information out to everybody. Um, if you don't know much about Youth Exchange, even though you're not going to uh, probably be able to exchange, um, you might attend that just to hear more about it. Um, ooh, we've got our Oktoberfest takeout, dinners and drinks, um, and the work, the teams are working on the 16th and 17th. This happens on the 17th, but we're making the food. And I know Ian had a plan to... Um, have you folks sign up today? And I don't know, I should have said ahead of time, um, but AJ, do you have, we'll, we'll move forward, but AJ, do you have the ability to pull up the Sign Up Genius and then I, and share it? Because I can't quite multitask. Sure. Um, so, okay, and then tell me when you're ready and I'll stop sharing. And also we have the blood drive challenge on October 23rd. And John, is there anything you want to share with us about that? Um, things will go much more smoothly if folks make an appointment, but if you don't have an appointment that day, go ahead and drop by. Um, there's a link to make appointments on the blood bank webpage, which is nccbb.org or Google blood bank. Great, great. And um, do you want me to do a press release about that or are you guys doing your own press release? Uh, the more the better. So if you do one, we'll do one. Oh, crud. You hear, hear me, my... Okay, we can, send me the info but, and I'll get that out. Bye -bye. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, my internet is unstable as it is every morning at seven um, or every Friday morning. I don't know what it's doing on other mornings because I'm not <laughs> I'm not looking at it. But anyway, so sorry about that. Um, there's also whoa, whoa, hey, there's also the virtual district conference is also on the 23rd. So you should have received information about that um, as well. And let's see if I can do this gently here. And the last thing to tell you about, oh, there's one more thing at the bottom of this, but I can't see it. Let's see. Oh, November 7th, the district uh, foundation celebration. And we should definitely all attend that because we kicked butt this last year and they're going to, they're going to recognize us and all the efforts of our club. Um, so please put that on your schedule to yell and scream uh, when we get awarded, whatever we get awarded. So that's we're that's getting a, we're getting a lot of awards, Maggie. We're getting a lot of awards. We are. We are getting we a are. lot of awards. I know, like more than more than one. More than one. More, more than, than two. One. More than okay, yeah. <laughs> How many? We're not going to play this game. You have to go and find out. So, I'm. I am. Um, okay. So let's go to AJ. Um, AJ, I'm going to stop sharing. Do you want to? Share the screen. There you all are. Okay, so what we've got here is a sign up genius for uh, the Oktoberfest. And as you can see, we still need some help. There's gonna be prep, food prep the day before to make things go a little faster on Sunday. We need, we need a few more people there. And we also need cooking team folks. Um, and we need, bar we need a couple more barbecues. We need somebody besides poor John to do the cleanup um, for <laughs> after those, those cookers make the mess. Um, and then also, then we'll have people over at the Griffin from one to 3.30 packing the meals. And then we will have the distribution team and cleanup team from 2.30 to about six um, 
And so we really, we really need everybody to take a slot. This, this is the only way this is going to work. Um, so I think Ian wanted to, to take names and put you down on the list, but what, um, uh, so if there's anyone who wants to sign up though, um, right now we can put you in. Otherwise, uh, please, please do this. Instead of listening to me, just go do this. <laughs> um, so Tracy wants to sign up. Great. Yes, Tracy. So um, Randy, you can maybe um, facilitate for that, getting her signed up um, with, and we'll get her signed up. Yay, Tracy. Um, so if anyone wants to throw their name in there right now, um, AJ can put it in there. Otherwise, we're going to be bugging you again until we get all these slots full. Um, it's fun too. We did it last year. It's a fun time. The other thing to remind you about related to this is we are looking for sponsors and uh, we have a few already. I want to give shout outs to the sponsors that we have. Um, we have uh, Scott Heller as a sponsor, Marty and uh, Marty and Terry are sponsors. Sorry, Terry. Um, uh, we've got Matt Babich as a sponsor. Nancy Knowles, a sponsor. I don't know if you folks know Nancy. Um, and uh, who else? Oh, Jackson Eklund is a sponsor. I think I'm forgetting someone. Uh, but we have room for more sponsors and you get free meals and drinks with your sponsorship. And also, Hider's a sponsor. Oh, that's right. Hider's a sponsor. Sorry, I knew there was one other big one. And um, you get free drinks and the food and you get um, thank you on the, on the social media. And so it's really um, a good opportunity to help out. If any of you want to sponsor and you haven't been contacted yet by anyone on our, on our team, please reach out to um, uh, Claire or, or well, Cam. Actually, Cam Appleton is kind of coordinating the sponsors. So reach out to him or you can let me know and we will get you hooked up for that. Okay, so thank you, AJ. So now, without further ado, we are going to go to Izzy to hear what her life has been like. And I'm, I'm, Ian might be here too, so I will also hopefully be turning it over to Ian. But Izzy, it's all yours. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry. Hi, Izzy. Hi, Ian. Okay. Um. I'd like to share my screen. I hope that's possible. Yes. Um, okay. So, okay, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Rotary for making my exchange to the US possible. My year in the US changed me 180 degrees and helped me become the person I am now. I would like to start my short presentation about my life since my exchange 2017-18 uh, with showing you some pictures. The picture on the left shows me and two friends from exchange in Budapest, um, Hungary, a country um, near Austria. It represents all the international friendships I made during my year in California. And since my exchange, I haven't once traveled without meeting people from my exchange. Um, yeah. <laughs> and furthermore, I would like to point out a very positive aspect of COVID-19. Um, even though I couldn't travel far, I saw one of the most beautiful places in Austria, Hallstatt. I've never been there before, but finally last summer, I went there with my boyfriend. Um, Austrians normally don't visit Hallstatt because it's ran over by tourists the whole summer long. Um, but last summer and this summer, Hallstatt was empty and it was absolutely wonderful. So if you come to Austria, Hallstatt is a stunning place. Um, that's the picture in the middle. Izzy, I'm not sure that you're in presentation mode. So, well, after my, okay, so do, do, do you see my slides? Well, we see all of the pictures. Little Three thumbnails. pictures on one slide. Nope. 
this looks like your finder when you're when you're pulling oh. up things. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait. Okay. Um, let me stop this for a second. Um, thank you for sure. Me. I think um, if you put it into presentation mode. Yes. Um, okay. Okay. Now. That uh, looks great. Izzy, good job. Yes. Okay. Well, um, this was my <laughs> beginning picture. Some, some pictures of my exchange and my host families. Um, yeah. Uh, on the left, you can see the picture from Budapest with my exchange friends. And the picture in the middle um, is a picture taken in Hallstatt. Okay. Can you see the next slide? Yes, is it all working? Okay. Yes, Izzy, Perfect. it's beautiful. Good job. Okay. Well, um, after my exchange, I joined an interact club in Vienna, and we have a week and help and organize a lot of charity projects. For example, we organize an annual young artists concert, charity concert. And as an interact board member in Austria, I was the main organizer of this concert in 2020. But unfortunately, the very first lockdown started exactly the day we were supposed to have the concert, um, which was really, really sad for me because I put so much effort into organizing this charity concert and it was so time consuming that I, I cried for days. <laughs> but well, um, then the pandemic started and all our interact meetings started being via Zoom. Um, I really, really missed the social interaction, but gladly we still had charity projects. For example, the so-called Wärmestube, where we cooked and served homeless people food. And this September, we finally had our first real meeting again. Yes. And I'd also like to tell you that this Rotarian year, I'm responsible for the public relations for the multi District Austria and Bosnia Herzegovina, 1910 and 1920. So if you have Instagram or Facebook, go check it out. I have to add that I'm currently still working on the Facebook page, but it will soon be ready. So if you're interested, please don't hesitate and follow and like our social media channels. So after my exchange, I additionally got involved with Rotex. Um, for example, we had a Rotex weekend right after exchange. Um, that's the picture on the top right. And um, the picture on the top left shows me and some exchange students in Austria while I'm giving them a tour through beautiful Vienna. Um, after my exchange, I went to high school for two more years. Um, in May 2020, I graduated. Um, right after the pandemic started, which was terrible because we didn't know anything about our finals and how school would end. Um, but however, two weeks before our finals, um, my class and I were finally able to attend school, but we were the only ones in the whole building. Um, that's the picture in the um, left upper corner. Um, gladly, the infection rate in June was very low in Austria. And so we were able to celebrate our graduation with our parents and teachers. And afterwards, my class and I traveled to Croatia to celebrate our graduation. Um, and now, well, I'm currently studying law at the University of Vienna. Um, I've actually only been in the university building a couple of times for classes. And that's why I had to, to take pictures from the internet. Um, I, I, I really like law, um, but what I passionately love is um, singing and dancing. And that's why I would like to study operetta or musical besides law. Um, however, the University of um, Music only takes four students per year. And well, so I, I'm going to have to study a lot more to get in. Um, well, as some of you may know, I'm a part of the youth choir of the State Opera in Vienna. And during the lockdowns in Austria, 
we were still able to perform our shows, but unfortunately only via live, uh, live stream. Um, however, in September, the opera, the opera opened um, with a live audience, which was awesome. <laughs> So, well, to make me more, even more stereotypical Austrian, I'd like to show you the most typical Austrian things I did since coming back from exchange. Um, first of all, I'd like to um, tell you something about the balls in Austria. Um, in Austria, every ball has an opening ceremony. Um, while opening a ball, a group of people dance a choreography and then a valse. Um, traditionally, the boys, but now it, but nowadays um, it can also be girls wear a black suit and the girls, of course, boys can as well, wear a white dress, um, as you can see on the picture on the right. And well, before the pandemic broke out, I opened eight balls in one season, even the night before my big math test. Um, yes, and also before the pandemic started, um, I had a visitor from the US, Carson McKinney, which most of you know, and um, of course I had to take him to a ball. Um, secondly, a very Austrian thing to do is to go to the Kirchtag, which is the Austrian Oktoberfest, and I've heard you're going to have an Oktoberfest as well. Um, but in Austria we go there with the traditional clothes um, called Dirndl and Lederhosen, which you can see on the pictures. Thirdly, a very Austrian thing to do is to go skiing. And personally, I think skiing is the most beautiful activity in Austria. Last year, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't go skiing um, because of COVID, but this year it will be possible. And I'm definitely going to be on the slope all winter long. Um, well, furthermore, I'd like to show you that my friends and I are supporters both of the Fridays for Future and the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think it's very, very important to stand up for things that are of such relevance. And I'm very happy that a lot of people think alike, as well in Arcata, as well as in Austria. And last but not least, I would like to thank you again for making my exchange year to the US possible, especially Ian, Nancy Dean, Nick, Tammy, and of course my three host families, Patty and Steve McKinney, Julian, Stan, Elkak Vasaid, and Mark and Nancy Andre for giving me the chance to experience living in a different country, for making me feel welcome and loved. During my exchange, I've always loved going to your Rotary meetings and helping with charity projects. And I've already been to multiple Rotary clubs in Austria and in the US, but I must say that the Rotary Club of Riqueda Sunrise is definitely by far the most fun, open-minded and motivated club I know. And lastly, I'd like to say that I'm only 19 years old, but my exchange has been the most challenging, but also the most exciting and empowering year of my life. Thank you. Wow, we're so, so happy to have you here talking with us. Oh my gosh, how much are you doing? <laughs> so, Izzy, I have a quick question. <laughs> I have a quick question for you. How, how much of what you're doing now do you think was influenced by your, your experience on exchange? Mm. Well, definitely my mindset changed during my exchange. Um, um, I, I opened my mind. <laughs> well, my, my horizon was opened and definitely all the activism I'm, do, I'm doing and I, I, I really um, try to look at what I buy. Um, I try only to buy fair fashion and to buy um, organic products and um, products that are from Austria, from the region. And all of this was really influenced by my exchange and by, by Arcada. <laughs> yes. But um, I think the singing and dancing stuff I've, I would have done with all, as well without going on exchange. That's fantastic. Who else has some questions?
I know uh, the, how incredibly important host families are, and, and you mentioned the ones that uh, had you with. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what you would want for the next exchange students with regard to host families and support. Um, I must say that I was a very, very lucky exchange student because all three of my host families were incredible. Um, they were super different, but all of them were great. And, but yeah, I think the most important thing as an exchange student and as a host family is to communicate, to, to communicate about, um, I, I remember I, uh, at my first host family, um, I brushed my teeth in the living room. And then afterwards, Patty told me that, um, that that's not what you do in the US or at least in their house and that they don't don't like that so I stopped doing that but at home um, here in Austria I brush my teeth for 10 minutes and I go through my house do the dishes whatever so I think it's really important that host families and exchange students communicate yes Charlie I see your hand up hi Izzy awesome great presentation um, I was just wondering um, if you do plan on coming back to the U.S., what's something that you really wanted to do or something you really want to see um, on your next visit? Um, so I'm, I'm actually planning on coming next summer, but I'm not sure if that's going to be possible with COVID. And um, what I haven't seen is the big... Um, uh, the, this big, this huge tree where you can drive through and well, I, I always wanted to do that, but it it never worked out. And yeah. Fantastic. Anyone else? I think we should all do a, a, a drive through tree trip with Izzy when she comes to visit. It'd be awesome. <laughs> That'd be great. Izzy, thank you so much for coming back. We really hope there's a day that comes sooner rather than later that you can actually return in person here and we can all be uh, showing you the trees again and uh, having a good time in Humboldt. So thank you so much for being here. It's thank great you. to see you. Okay, folks. Well, um, I'm sure Maggie did a fantastic job of covering my technical difficulty, but uh, by the four-way test, technical difficulties means I forgot to set my alarm last night. So I'm really sorry for being here late. Um, I know, uh, Maggie jumped on uh, unexpectedly this morning. So I really appreciate that. And uh, thank you everybody for your patience as we got started here. Um, hi, Nikki, I just saw you come on there. Thanks for being here. And hi, Lark. Um, next, uh, you know, we, we are privileged to be thinking about going back into exchange next year. Uh, the, the district and our club and the other Arcata Club in McKinleyville have been working hard on making preparations for the next exchange opportunity, which will be for 2022-23. I don't know if you know, Izzy, but we've been shut down for the last couple of years uh, on exchange because of COVID. And so we're very excited. But uh, to our club, if you know somebody who might uh, have a student who would be a great ambassador, please uh, put them in touch with this informational meeting coming up on October 11th. I will send this out uh, to the club so that you can share it with folks that you think might be interested and make a great ambassador, but what an opportunity and what a life changing as Izzy just explained how profoundly impacting that is for our students. Next, um, because I was late and because Izzy had a lot to say, which is fantastic. Thank you, Izzy. We're going to hold this for the end. So anybody who wants to stay on has been having trouble signing up for uh, the help that we need. We need about 25 more people. We have slots from one hour to four hours, and I will help you get signed up at the end of this meeting. So if you're not signed up yet, stay on, and we'll go right through that. And thank you to our sponsors. We have many sponsors, some within the club. Thank you for uh, jumping on and, and making a major donation to this event to help it work and be successful. We really appreciate that. And there's still opportunity to uh, be a sponsor. So if you wish, follow the social media links or go straight to our website and there's opportunity to be a sponsor on there for our dinner. 
Charlie, tell us about this. I, I put this up last week and you weren't here. Um, but what are you doing jumping out of a perfectly good, good plane? There's got to be a backstory. Um, it's something that I've always just wanted to do in the back of my head. Um, I'm, I'm actually terrified of heights. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I get nervous like jumping off rocks. I'm like, I don't understand why anyone would ever do this. Um, and then I don't know, yeah. something clicked about, you know, a year ago where I was like, I just really feel like I can go. Like I felt like at peace. I felt good. I was just, I don't know. And I've always wanted to go with somebody that like I really cared for. And I like, you know, cause I think it's like a really good bonding experience. And so when I decided that it was time to go, uh, Tom and I actually try to coordinate uh, cause Tom is one of my very good friends that, and he goes all the time. And I was like, yeah, let's go. And, uh, and I called my niece up. And so my niece and I, and my niece was like, yeah, let's go. And uh, yeah, it was pretty surreal because I was nervous and excited and I thought I was going to be terrified the entire time. I watched this like video of like Will Smith talking about his experience and he's like nervous. He's like in the, like, he's like, Oh, everyone was drunk when we agreed to do this. And he ended up like, he's like, they're going to, no one's going to be in the lobby and everyone's in the lobby. He's like, shoot. And he's like talking about every moment being terrifying until he jumps out. And I was just like, I don't know what I'm wired different or something. Cause I was just like, nervous and excited a little bit and then like even jumping out of the plane for the free fall I was like whoa this is really cool and then like the scariest part was like the parachute coming out because it like pulls you up really suddenly and I was just like whoa and I was like well good thing I wasn't in charge of that because I did not remember that was gonna happen <laughs> and the um people at um uh, what is it called um oh, I can't remember the name not Cloverdale is it Cloverdale anyways the jumping uh the the place um the guy was like I was like can you do tricks while we're up there and he's like yeah we can do tricks and he like let me steer a little bit and he asked me if I get nauseous and I lied uh, <laughs> and I said no because I wanted the best experience and so he started doing like corkscrews while we were up there and it was like amazing and we got down and I was like my equilibrium was all off and then we drove somewhere and I was like I'm still sick and I, I definitely got sick but I was happy I lied because <laughs> I was just like yeah. you know if you're gonna get wet you might as well go swimming so awesome so uh experience wise doing it again gonna go with Tom next time yeah definitely yeah awesome. Tom was gonna make it but yeah Tom and I have plenty to do again. Well, that puts it one step closer to my uh list so thanks for inspiring us and i can hear your energy it's it clearly was exciting for you thanks for sharing that's awesome maggie um help me understand we we were cited for something uh from maggie's year and uh you know it the the rotary Inter international information comes in somewhat vaguely you know we received this certificate and said we were cited um for helping but it took some uh, detective work. So Maggie and I met yesterday and went through our uh, club information. And this this is uh, really a look back applause to Maggie's year as president during the full lockdown. And, uh, you know, she set out uh, 18 goals for our club. And we had a target uh, from Rotary National to achieve 13 of them. And she blew it out of the water. And with the help of all of us, of course, uh, we completed 16 of 18 of those goals. And the, the common themes we kept seeing um, were how giving we are to the foundation and to causes of Rotary, uh, our involvement as a club, you know, getting involved in doing the projects that we set out in front of us, and our engagement with each other through fellowship and our meetings, attendance, and things like that. So uh, only one of three clubs of our 52 in the district received this citation for making their achievements during the year of COVID. So this is applause and thanks to Maggie for getting us through that dark year. Maggie, do you have anything to say about that? Um, uh, I would say that... The bad um, note comes from so it's kind of like for you. Can, can somebody, can, can everybody, uh, uh, mute, everybody please? should mute themselves. Um, and uh, Ian, why don't you give me um, co-hosting um, control so I can do that to people because that's the funnest part of being a co-host. Um, 
Yes, this was because you guys all stepped up. We set goals, we blew them out of the water, especially around foundation giving, uh, service projects. We set five, we did 16. Um, and everyone, you know, I kept hearing everyone say, we don't have, we can't do anything, we can't do anything. And we did, and we could. And so I really wanted to to put that and show that we were actively doing projects. So, um, Sometimes I accidentally hit this. and uh, so that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. And um, we we were only one of three clubs in our district to receive this this year. So good job, you guys. Well, every inspired Rotarian uh, does depend on a leader to move them in that direction. So thank you, Maggie, for being that leader in that tough year. We really appreciate it. And uh, I know that will carry over forward into this year, what you set up as a precedent for how to get it done, even in a lockdown. So thank you very much, Maggie. We really appreciate you. Yeah. Next, we have a winner this morning. We have a winner this morning. Nick, are we ready? We don't know who it is yet, but we know there's a winner. There's only two balls left in the, the draw bag for our raffle. Izzy, I, I see your hand up. No, it, it's just a clapping emoji. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? Take it away, Nick. You All got this. right. Um, so here we go. We are doing uh, $130 raffle. I do have to admit that last week, I know Brian Reeser was one winner and I'm not sure who the other winner was because my site crashed and I lost a name. That's five so, bucks to somebody. Yes. So if you Brian. did win last week, let me know and I will give you your $5. Um, Nick, Nick, yep. it was Craig, Craig Newman. Craig. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And um, this week is like $130. Let's see who the winner is. And I changed up our thing a little bit. In honor of Halloween, we have a little Halloween theme, but so many names are on here. And we have AJ as the first. And AJ, you're the no winner. <laughs> All right. But since we do have two drawings each time, I do get to draw another one. <laughs> and if you're lucky enough, we will. Uh... You might be a winner again, may win $20. Um, one thing I do want to say is that when we do a uh, dollar on the table, let's. Um, collect your change from your home, put it in a jar. And when we meet back in person, instead of, you know, trying to do dollar on the table here uh, electronically, just bring that in and uh, we will just add that to the raffle. All right, so here we go. We will do, and that was Ian's idea, not mine. <laughs> so they're, they're thanking me, but it should be Ian that we're thanking. You said it, Nick, thank you. All right, and um, AJ again. So, yeah. <laughs> congratulations, AJ. Uh, thanks to everybody who you know puts in every week. Uh, I know that uh, it's a little thing, but it really does help our club to keep our operations going. So, thank you for that. Next, uh, we'd like to introduce our. Featured presenter, our Lark Doolin. I saw you come on the call here when I finally made it. Uh, Charlie would like to introduce you formally to our club and uh, thank you for being here and offering a presentation for us. Yeah, awesome. I'm really excited, as always, to introduce Lark Doolin. Um, since I've met him, he's always been a um, huge advocate for social justice and restorative practices and all these amazing things um, that he brings to his students as far as like, um, like therapeutic things. He has a, a meditation labyrinth and he has two, you know, I've just known him as a, as a very strong person in our community and advocate for um, people. Uh, today, him and Nico Katman both volunteer with 
Uh, Queer Humboldt Lark is the executive director and together with our team of staff of volunteers, um, they create a safe, inclusive place for marginalized people in Humboldt County and also surrounding areas. Um, so club, please welcome Lark Doolin. And Nico. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having me back. It's great to be here again. Um, I'm Lark Doolin, Executive Director of Queer Humble. They use he, him pronouns. Nico, you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Nico Campan. I use they, them pronouns. I'm a volunteer at Queer Humble and yeah. <laughs> so um, one thing I always like to do is to give an itinerary for our experience. Um, so Nico, go for it. So yes, we're gonna go over some vocabulary and key concepts, and then we're gonna give you some practical tips on how to use those key concepts in real life. And then we're going to tell you what's up at Queer Humble. And if we have time, we'll do a Q&A at the end. So before we start, Queer Humble affirms our gratitude to the Wiat, Yurok, Hoopa, Karuk, and neighboring tribes for their leadership, stewardship, and many cultural contributions, both historical and present day. We affirm native sovereignty and pledge to actively dismantle settler colonialism through our work in the community. Queer people exist in all communities, thus queer liberation is inexcrutably intertwined with the Black Lives Matter movement. Just immigration policies and practices, native sovereignty, disability rights, feminism, and all movements that dismantle systems of oppression. I think this is a really important um, concept because whatever social justice work a person is doing, you know, there's a queer aspect to it. And for whatever queer work we're doing, um, there's an anti-racist aspect and an anti-ableist aspect and all of these things. Um, I'm gonna pop yes. into, the, into the chat. Oh, sorry. Um, I popped into a chat, just our website, in case you want to check out our website and get a feel for us that way. And I'm also just popping into the chat a video that uh, covers the, the concept of two spirit. So if you have 20 minutes today or six minutes today, it's a six minute video. Um, and you want to learn a little about the two spirit movement, where it came from, what it's about. Um, I'm just popping that resource in the chat in case you want to save that for later. So key concepts. Uh, one of them is basically sexual orientation does not equal gender identity. I can tell you my gender identity and you wouldn't necessarily know my sexual orientation and vice versa. Yeah, I think this one is like a really common concept that gets conflated because the LGBTQ umbrella um, conflates all these, right? So like a gay person might know very little about trans people. And a trans person might know very little about gay culture, and yet we're all kind of one queer community. And so sometimes people think we're talking about sexual orientation when we're actually talking about gender identity or vice versa. Um, so just to tease these out a little, sexual orientation is about who you love, who you're attracted to, who you wanna build your family with. And gender identity is about how you relate to gender in our culture, how you feel about your gender, and how you express your gender has nothing to do with your romance life or who you're attracted to. So these are separate concepts. And then similarly, um, in terms of things that get really conflated, physical bodies get conflated with gender and you know, it's a sex and gender or biological sex and gender. And these are actually really different concepts. Um, you know, biological sex is about your anatomy. It's about what you're born with. It's about your chromosomes. It's those things. Gender is about all the cultural expectations that we put, put on those. So around the world and throughout history, gender is different in different places, right? So there are places in the world where like men wearing skirts is very, very normal, um, like Scotland and India. There, there are times in history where men wearing heels is very masculine, right? George Washington wore heels. That was something that men did in that time. So these are cultural norms. And so when we're talking about gender, we're talking about culture. It's a very separate conversation than biology. And people try to, try to make these the same and they're not, and they never really have been. And so one thing that's helpful is to just be very specific in our language because a person's anatomy 
doesn't tell you about their gender and a person's gender doesn't tell you about their anatomy. Nico, anything you want to add to that one? Um, yes. So uh, for me, like a good way like to remember this is that gender is between your ears. So and um, and biological sex is is basically in your chromosomes. Uh, just to break it down to the, the essentials. Uh, for me, like, for example, I am part Japanese and it is a very, very customary. Like there's a specific kind of kimono that you wear if you are a male and if, versus you are a female. And I have never, ever been comfortable in like being like constricted and having like the, like, like it just, it's just not a fun time for me. So my mom would always give me uh, like, honoring my gender identity always give me a, a kimono for a man and uh and you know and my mom's like 66 so <laughs> one thing that um that I think is is really helpful to remember is that right now we happen to be living in a, in a culture that is really discriminatory towards trans people but throughout the world and throughout history, that hasn't always been the case. In pretty much every continent, except for the Antarctic, queer people have existed and trans people specifically have existed, often holding sacred roles within society and special cultural roles. Right now, we happen to be living in a society where we're marginalized and discriminated against, but that's not the truth of who we are, and that's not the truth of who we can be in this world. And so part of the work that we do at Queer Humble is education-based, um, so that we can learn about the, the natural diversity that exists within gender, and that's always existed within gender, that's just been actively erased in our current society. We do find it's really important to just like pause a little and talk about vocabulary, because sometimes when I start talking about queer topics, I say LGBTQ, and 20 minutes into the conversation, the other person says, what do the letters mean? Um, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been talking for 20 minutes and we're not actually communicating. Or I do a whole presentation at the end, um, someone's like, their question is, what cisgender mean? And I realized I've said cisgender 20 times and they, they weren't able to follow all of these contents because we don't all show up to, to this meeting this morning with the same education about queerness and the same vocabulary around queerness. And even within the queer community, language is always evolving and changing. And part of that is, by design, right? The English language is not designed to talk about us and our experiences. You know, we've been actively erased from language for so many decades that it's clunky and hard to talk about. LGBTQ2+, right? It's not an acronym that just like rolls off the tongue and is easy to talk about like potatoes. And that's part of being a marginalized person. Um, and it's something that other movements also experience. And so we like to take a moment to define a couple of these terms just so that we're on the same page about how we're using language today. And also because the definitions of these might've changed since you learned them. So for example, when I learned lesbian as a word, it meant women who love women. Whereas now more and more people are using it to mean non-men who love non-men, which is a non-binary inclusive way of using the word lesbian. So that's like a shift in language. Not all lesbians have the same definition. So when someone says, oh, we've got a lesbian potluck, I'm always like, so how do you define that? Because I don't wanna send a trans woman into a space that's unsafe or unwelcoming um, or a non-binary person into a space that isn't gonna welcome them. And so taking the time to kind of pause and like be like, what do you mean when you use that word? Can be really helpful to make sure we have clarity and communication. Nika, you wanna take one? You're muted. Yes, uh, I, I would love to take one. Um, so I identify as non-binary. Um, and that means that uh, we have a, like in our society, we have a gender binary. Uh, and there are certain aspects of that, of, the, of that gender binary that you're in. If you're a man, there are certain aspects that you have to like certain performative things that you have to do for your gender identity. I exist outside of that. So I have never really, uh, I, I didn't um, really connect with my assigned uh, sex, assigned, assigned gender at birth. Um, and, uh, and I was always like told like I was a tomboy and stuff like that. So for me, non-binary can mean a lot of different things for every, for everybody. It's just like the term lesbian 
you can talk to many different non-binary people and they will give you a different definition of non-binary, but really it just means someone who exists outside of that gender binary. So they could be agender, like they don't identify with a gender. They can be bigender, they identify with more than one gender. They can be gender fluid, their gender identity shifts from day to day. Um, and, or they can just identify as non-binary and not, uh, and not elaborate further. Awesome. Thank you, Nico. Um, I'll, I'll define transgender. The way I define transgender is anyone who radically transgresses gender norms. Anyone who radically transgresses gender norms. So for example, I was born, the doctor said, it's a girl. And that is not who I am. Like I am a guy so clearly and within myself and people who really get to know me, um, even when I was presenting like, like a woman and I hadn't yet transitioned, people would be hanging out with me and they'd be like, oh, you're a queer guy. I get you now, right? They would have this aha moment where they saw me for who I am. Um, and eventually I decided to transition and live full time as a guy. And so that's a, that's a pretty radical transgression of gender norms in our society. Um, transitioning from one gender to another. And the word transgender is a huge umbrella term and includes a lot of different people. Um, cisgender, on the other hand, is people who are born and the doctor's like, or the midwife or, or the lucky taxi driver is like, it's a girl. And if you grow up and you feel like a girl and you dress like a girl, that's called cisgender. Or if you're born and they say, it's a boy and you grow up and you feel like a boy and you express yourself like a guy, that's called cisgender. So if what you were assigned at birth matches how, who you feel on the inside and how you live, that's called cisgender. And if you radically transgress those gender norms, transgender is a word for that. Um, and then queer is just a huge umbrella term that so many people use to describe anyone who's not heterosexual and or cisgender. Um, not all queer people use these words to describe themselves. Often education is a major factor. So it's more likely that educated people will call themselves members of the LGBTQ2 plus community um, because access to language and access to education and the tools for understanding these concepts is not something that we all have equal access to. And so there are tons of queer people that don't identify as queer. They don't use a word for it. They just are who they are and, um, and prefer not to use labels, right? Um, or, or who attended an LGBTQ event and experienced ableism or racism or some, some other type of ism or obia, and then are like, well, that's not my community. You know, I just happen to like, like other women or whatever it is. And so, you know, the thing about this, this language is it's so imperfect, but we're doing our best to describe something, which is that we are people who exist outside of what our society tells us is allowed because of who we love or how we feel and how we interact with gender. Um, so this natural aspect of human diversity has been annexed in our society to be othered. And I think some people don't realize just how much that can impact us every day. Um, certainly in the pandemic, I've had the privilege of being home a lot. And so I'm not experiencing transphobia every day in the way that I was before the pandemic. And it's given me the opportunity to look at how normalized that experience of discrimination had become for me. Um, I think there are a lot of gender expansive youth that have realized who they are through their friends online over the last year and a half who are now returning to schools. And we're seeing a huge increase in, in youth identifying as being non-binary. Um, and, and one of the things Queer Humble does is support schools in um, trainings and mental health support for youth. I always like to include this uh, definition of bisexuality because I think bisexuality is hugely misunderstood. Um, and this is a quote by Robin Oakes, who's a bisexual advocate and author. She says, bisexuals are people who acknowledge in themselves the potential to be attracted romantically and or sexually to people of more than one sex and or gender, not necessarily at the same time, not necessarily in the same way, and not necessarily to the same degree. And I love this definition um, because I grew up being told bisexuals are people who are attracted to men and women. Well, first of all, that's binary. There's more than two genders. Um, there, I, last time I counted, I got to at least 13 and then I gave up um, because there's so many different ways to, to express gender within our society and to feel one's gender. 
Um, so I appreciate that this is a non-binary inclusive definition for bisexuality, but I also appreciate it's not about your behavior and what you've done. There's plenty of people that get married young and are in heterosexual marriages and recognize within themselves that they can feel attracted to more than one gender. And even if they never act on that, recognizing that potential within oneself, that's bisexuality. Um, and so there's a lot of people around us who are bisexual who don't necessarily know that. Hey, congratulations. If you're someone who just realized I might be bisexual, congratulations. Sometimes we get that feedback after our, our trainings. Um, I've had a lot of people come up to me after our trainings and say, I never knew there was a word for someone like me. Um, I've had many senior citizens come up to me and say, they never taught me. I've been trying to describe this thing my whole life. I'm non-binary. I finally have a word for it, right? Um, so I just want to celebrate this moment for anyone who's having that experience, because it, it actually happens after about half of our trainings that someone follows up uh, in that way. All right. L G G B D T T T I Q Q A A P. Um, there are so many letters. There are so many letters and they just keep coming. There's so many words. And what I want to emphasize to you is that it's not about knowing all the letters. And it's not about knowing all the words because it's always changing. I learned a new one like a week ago. Um, it's about showing people your support. It's about believing people when they tell you who they are and not challenging someone, questioning someone or asking them to prove something that they're sharing with you from a place of generosity and vulnerability. And so you don't have to know all the words and all the language all the time. I mess up sometimes too, um, but you can still show your support by honoring and respecting people's identities by using the names that they use for themselves and the pronouns that they use for themselves. Th these are two of the most important things you can do to reduce the risk of suicide for gender expansive youth. And they're two of the most important things you can do to create a welcoming space for queer people in your environment. And so with pronouns, um, I just want to take a moment and talk about pronouns because every time I present, I get questions about pronouns. I recently presented, I got eight questions and they were eight questions about pronouns. And I think that this is kind of where the rubber meets the road because a lot of queerness you can just kind of ignore or be like, okay, whatever, I'm cool with that. But you don't have to interact with it necessarily. Whereas with pronouns, when someone says I use, for example, I use he, him pronouns, People who knew me before I transitioned had to change what pronouns they were using for me. And that's something that they have to do, right? A lot of queerness, you can just kind of ignore and you don't really, you can accept it or, or not accept it. It doesn't really matter. You don't have to do anything in regards to it. But with pronouns, you're being asked to change something that you're doing. And specifically, you're being able, you're being asked to change what words you use to describe someone because who they are is not who you thought they were or who when you look at them, you assume they must be. And that's where work comes in. And so I just really wanna encourage you to take the time to get people's pronouns right. And I practice in front of the mirror um, if, I, if I mess up. So if I mess up twice on someone's pronouns, I go to them privately and I say, I want you to know I'm gonna practice in the mirror for two minutes every time I mess up because I know how important this is and I'm committed to getting it right. And lo and behold, practice really, really, really helps retrain, retrain the brain. Um, so I just really want to encourage that because it makes a, a huge difference. Being mispronounced can ruin someone's day. Can ruin someone's day. Um, it depends on the person, you know, and they might may or may not tell you if it ruined their day. So those are just a couple of thoughts. I do want to, um, I know we're getting near the end of time. And I just want to talk a little about Queer Humble because um, we've been around since 2004. And the former leadership retired a year ago, which is when I came on as executive director with my new board. Um, we are intentionally anti-racist as an organization. The majority of our board are people of color. We prioritize centering people who have multiple marginalized identities. For example, people who are queer and disabled or people who are people of color and queer, because we realize that um, that there are lots and lots of people of color in the queer community who have not been celebrated and welcomed in queer spaces, and we're committed to doing that. And we ask that other people who are doing other social justice work take a moment to ponder how queerness is impacting your community 
and how you can make sure that you're being intersectionally aware of queer people within, within other populations as well, because we're part of all of the populations. Um, we have a whole bunch of services that we've launched in the last year. Some of these came from the pandemic and realizing our community was in urgent need of help. Um, and others were ones that um, we've been doing for a long time. So for example, we have a micro grant program uh, which provides mutual aid and micro grants. So for example, a uh, two-spirit mother raising a two-spirit child um, wanted gender inclusive children's books for her child. And so we helped her get um, picture books in her house that showed families like hers. Um, another example would be a, um, a member of our community who wanted to be a uh, mental health clinician and needed uh, a fee, $130, to pay the fee in order to take a test, in order to be of service in the substance abuse community, um, helping our community. So, so one of those are some examples. We also have a mental, mental health counseling center. So we provide sliding scale therapy with mental health clinicians um, for children who are queer, for adults who are queer, and for the parents of gender expansive youth. So for example, if a kid comes out as transgender and the parent is struggling with that, we want to help that parent get on board because while we can help the kid directly, nothing is going to be as impactful as, as that parent loving their child and knowing how to support them. And so we work with straight and cisgender parents in that way as well. Uh, we do community education like this presentation today. We do advocacy, for example, a transgender inmate in our local jail. Um, we're helping her out with some legal things and um, a pen pal. We do community building events and we connect people to resources. Uh, for example, people moving to the area that need help finding a gay friendly realtor because they're nervous about being a gay couple um, coming to a rural area. And we also provide internships set ships. So we have a, a social work intern from HSU. Um, so I know we're at time. This is when we usually do our Q&A, but um, Ian, I'll, I'll throw the baton back to you and just thank you so much for having us out. We love serving our community and and it's a privilege to come and meet you today. Um, my name is Lark Doolin. My email is larkdoolin at gmail. Um, and I'm really happy to connect and support you in the work that you're doing. We are launching a fundraiser later today for our micro grant program. Uh, we've provided almost $11,000 in $50 to $200 increments for queer community members in need. Um, and we're ready to do a second round of that program. And so we're starting that fundraiser today. All right, thanks everyone. And thank you, Nico. Lark thank you Nico. everyone for having us. Lark and Nico, thank you so much for being out with us today. And, uh, you know, this is such an important um, realization in our community. You know, you're, you're among friends here. I, I know that uh, there was a fundraiser that I did for our birthday and uh, many of our members here contributed to that for Career Humboldt. Um, and, you know, we, one of the things that you touched on earlier had to do with uh, how queerness in general has been erased from uh, our language. Our language has been colonial and set up in a binary manner. And I know that uh, as my own children uh, have revealed who they are to themselves and to our family, uh, language has been a real struggling point for my elder parents and to, to help them understand how to function in a, a language that really did not include, by design, queerness. So thank you for touching on that. That's, that's so important to realize. So as all of us uh, work within our language and hear these new terms, I'd say new to us because we've been just uh, neglected to have them included, um, please understand that this is rebuilding lost language. Who has uh, other questions for uh, Lark and uh, Nico? I put a question in the chat um, or just in terms of queer humbled and your involvement with uh, older older adults who are in the in the population because we see um, a lot of ageism associated with well, there's a lot of ageism in our society and, and just how that double impacts older adults, especially around healthcare issues, around, um, you know, who, is, who are they sharing information with, whether people have rights to share that information and, and how the medical community looks at them. And also 
what happens if they feel like they have to go into a facility setting um, where they going back in the closet is a real big deal. I mean, do you have members and uh, older adults who you're supporting in, in these issues? Yes, absolutely. And I was just putting in the chat when you started talking that, to respond to that because it's so important. Um, respecting our elders is something the queer community has not always done a great job at. And so it is one of the many ways that we're uh, centering double marginalized people or multi marginalized people. So we share resources for older LGBTQ adults um, on our Facebook group. And we also are um, support. I just I just thought of one and it slipped my mind. Um, but yes, uh, oh, we're working with a group that's starting a local nursing home um, that is, is explicitly building queer inclusion into their practice um, because that is such a huge problem in terms of discrimination in the later years. So yeah, this is definitely something we're aware of and, and being proactive about. And I'll email you offline to talk about more resources, so. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, we have resources on our website and we, we love more, so we invite them. Okay, thanks. How does one participate in your fundraiser? Yeah, so we're gonna be posting it on Facebook later today. Um, we're, we discovered the beauty of um, Facebook fundraisers thanks to Ian. Um, we'd never done one and I was like, whoa, this is cool. <laughs> um, so we're gonna give that a try today. Um, and so keep an eye on Facebook. We've got a Facebook page, Queer Humboldt, and we'll be posting it there probably this afternoon. They make it so easy. I, I, that's why I was in contact so much, Lark. I, I, it made me nervous to know, is this a real thing? Does, it, does the funds actually come through? So thanks for playing along there. <coughs> we appreciate it. Okay, uh, real quick to wrap up the meeting. Again, thank you so much, Lark and uh, Nico for being here. We genuinely appreciate uh, the education and I know it's not on your shoulders to do that educating, but it's a great touch and starting point for everybody here to uh, look further and understand. So thank you. Uh, real quick, just briefly, remember we've got another week uh, to submit your uh, costume pictures. This can be from any part of your life. This is just for fun. Uh, I've received some and uh, looking back at our old uh, fundraising events, especially the spring fundraisers, I know our club likes to dress up. So please send in your favorites and uh, there will be prizes on uh, Freakish Final Friday. Um, Lark and uh, Nico, in recognition of your presenting here today, uh, we have two things. We, we make a donation to the Wheelchair Foundation in your name, which uh, provides wheelchairs to people that could not otherwise afford them. So thank you for the you know, presenting and giving us up that opportunity to give in your name. And then uh, at the end of each meeting, I provide a, uh, my, my form of expression is haiku. And uh, for better or worse, <laughs> I've uh, written this one for you two and the queer community. So thank you for uh, inspiring me. Inclusivity, LGBTQ2+, love for everyone. Thank you everyone today. Again, if you'd like to stay on, please do to uh, uh, get signed up. I'll help you get that process done. We do need volunteers uh, to make our Oktoberfest successful. So stay on the call if you can, I'll get you signed up right away. Thank you everybody. <laughs>